Our scripture reading this morning is from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 12 and reading through verse 25. It begins on page 1357 in the Pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along there. So then, my friends, we have an obligation, but it is not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful actions, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's children. For the Spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children. And by the Spirit's power, we cry out to God, Father, my Father. God's Spirit joins Himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Since we are His children, we will possess the blessings He keeps for His people. And we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for Him. For, we, for if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share His glory. I consider that what we suffer at this present time cannot be compared at all with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. All of creation waits with eager longing for God to reveal his children. For creation has condemned to was condemned to lose its purpose, not of its own will, but because God willed it to be so. Yet there was the hope that creation itself would one day be set free from its slavery to decay and would share the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that up to the present time, all of creation groans with pain, like the pain of childbirth. But, if it, it, is not, but it is not just creation alone which groans. We who have the Spirit as the first of God's gifts also groan within ourselves as we wait for God to make us his children and to set our whole being free. For it was by hope that we were saved. But if we see what we hope for, then it is not really hope. For who of us hopes for something we see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. May God bless the reading of his word. The idea of an inheritance is something that writers, both of books and of movies, have used as a means of telling a story. It gives them an opportunity when they, when they write about someone perhaps getting ready to receive an inheritance. And, of course, in, uh, writers can do whatever they want with the story, but so often in order to, to create this story, they will tell the story in such a way that you have been chosen to receive this inheritance. But in order to receive the inheritance, there are certain things that you have to do. Like what? Well, you know, writers will do something like... Uh, uh, give away so much money in a certain period of time or get married and 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 sometimes you have to within a, within a year you have to get married and produce an heir for for you know the the name the family name whatever it is it's something that is presented in such a way that it creates tension because that's what the writer wants that's what keeps us in the story now, on the other side of that, when the person, so often when the person receives the word that they are to receive this inheritance, and the way the writers do this, that's usually not what they're wanting. They don't want to do this. And so now their goal, their purpose is to do everything they can to receive the inheritance, but to still have their way. They want what they want, but they want to do it in such a way that they will deceive the executor so that they can go ahead and receive the inheritance. Sometimes in the stories it works. Writers can do whatever they want. But is that really, does it really work? 
what about if we take this story and think about it a little more? And let's just say that this is a slave who suddenly is being told, you are going to receive the inheritance. But in order to receive the inheritance, there are certain things that you have to do. You have to stop acting like a slave. You have to learn to think about others, not just yourself. You have to learn to be generous. Obviously, so often, slaves are thinking only in terms of how they can, how they can get around what the master wants them to do. Do just enough to appear to be doing what the master wants, but watching out for and taking care of myself. What can I do? Oh, but all of a sudden now you're, you have been slated. You've been chosen to receive the inheritance. What, then, what are you going to do? How are you going to learn to act <coughs> in such a way that you no longer act like a slave? Well, it's possible you may seek out teachers and tutors who can instruct you. Perhaps you change the way you dress. Perhaps you change the way you carry yourself. Instead of always looking down and never making eye contact, suddenly, in order to, be, to receive this inheritance, you have to learn to make eye contact with others. Because you are now going to be an equal with anyone. Would you, as the slave, be willing to do these things in order to receive the inheritance? If you were that person, would you be willing to make those changes? To step out of the role you carry now to, to, become, to become something else? Now, this idea of taught for us, so it's conceivable. As long as, as we're thinking in terms of the inheritance here, uh, which usually would be uh, money or land or, or some form of riches, it's not too hard to think about doing that as long as what we're being asked to do is not immoral or illegal. We would do anything possible to make the necessary changes so that we get the inheritance. If we didn't, everyone would look at us and say, you, are, you have got to be one of the dumbest people I've ever met. We might even think that of ourselves. Why would I not do that if I am being offered this wonderful, this great inheritance? This is the essence of what Paul is telling us in Romans. It's what he was writing to the Romans about. It's what he is writing to us about. And he has laid out the argument about sin. We understand how horrible it is. He even now again tells us, that to follow it is to die. He's told us about the shortcomings of the law, how it shows us what sin is, how it, how it reveals how destructive sin is, and yet in the end, how the law, the Torah, God's law, is not capable of producing that salvation, of not doing what is necessary to make the change. And he has shown and repeatedly stated how it is Christ through whom we are saved, how we are set free. In Christ, through Christ, we have the Spirit of God. We have the Spirit in us when we are in Christ. It means that when our hope and our trust is in Christ, we are new, we are different. We're no longer a slave. We have been offered an inheritance. If you're offered an inheritance, wouldn't you do everything possible to be found worthy of receiving that inheritance? The interesting thing, the unique thing is, is that when we receive this inheritance, Paul says that it makes us fellow heirs, fellow recipients of the inheritance with Christ. We are fellow heirs with 
Messiah. For what God promised him, the resurrection is promised to us. The kingdom is promised to us. There's an interesting thing here that as we look at this, we need to consider. Paul doesn't have a problem with this idea. We so often do. Maybe it's because we so often think in terms of, of the kingdom and the Messiah and our salvation as being, being saved. When you come to Christ, when you accept Christ, you are saved. And what does that mean for us? It means that we are saved from hell. It's kind of the turn so you won't burn attitude. We are saved. Well, for Paul, being a child of God, being an heir with Messiah... It is that, but, but it's, it's so much more. It's the idea that if Jesus is the sovereign Lord, then we share, as we share in his, in his inheritance, as Jesus rules over all things, and he rules over all things with love, then those of us who are part of the inheritance share in that rule. But the goal of that rule is not to rule the way we think a king, we think of in terms of ruling, which is so often that of a, an earthly king, which so often is to have dominance over someone else. Instead, the rule, as Christ rules, it is to bring redemption to the world. It is to bring God's love, God's grace, God's mercy to the world. That's what redemption is. Sometimes we get mistaken and we think that it's through rules and dogma that, that we bring about redemption. And rules and dogma have a place. They do have their place. But so often what rules and dogma are used for is to raise one group above another. Far too often it's used as a measuring tool to determine if someone is worthy of being raised from one level to the next. Are you worthy of being a part of my group? Paul says that's, that's not the way it's done. This is not the way of, of God's kingdom, of the kingdom of Christ. It is not the way of the rule of redemption. It is not the way of an heir of God through Christ. Instead, Paul says that the route that is to be taken is one of suffering. It shouldn't be hard for us to understand considering that uh, Paul says that it is Christ who has redeemed us and we, we know from the stories of the gospel and the stories the, uh, found in Acts and, and in other places. We know that story. We know that in order to save us that he was whipped and beaten, that Jesus was put on trial, that he was mocked, and eventually, when they got tired of that, they took him out to a place outside of the city and they executed him. And in all of that, he took our place. Now consider in a moment of time, the way we think about it, that happened far in the past, and it's a little difficult for us to, to understand or to, to wrap our heads around the idea that Christ took our sins to the cross. But we are limited to time in a linear fashion. That's the way we think about time. But remember what Scripture tells us, the way God looks at time, the way the, 
The Bible talks about Jesus seeing time. The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and in him there is, there's not this sense of time as we know it and understand it. So consider this, and Christ is the one that could do this. That even though if you did something yesterday, that was yesterday for you. But in Christ, when he went to the cross in the present, in the real, in real time, in, in that moment, he was experiencing what you did yesterday. I know it's difficult for us to wrap our heads around this, but that is the power of God in this. That he was able to take our sin to the cross in that moment. It is the power of God's salvation and love through Christ that, that Paul says now when we know that, as a part of the kingdom, as a part of the redemption, we will end up suffering. And he doesn't, he doesn't indicate, he doesn't tell us what kind of suffering that will be. From his own experience, we know that it could include being mocked, that it could include being beaten and jailed, being ridiculed. It might even include death. He was present at the death of Stephen, so he, and he probably saw to it before he came to Christ that one or two others that we don't know about probably saw their death. And he already seems to know and understand that at some point down his, in his future, that may be for him too. Not just a natural death, but a violent death that comes as a result of faith in Christ. We know this is possible. It happens in the world today. It is happening now to those who believe and who trust in Christ. But for Paul, all of these things are immaterial. He wants us to understand the majesty of what it is to be one who will inherit the kingdom, to be an heir. H-E-I-R, to be one who through God in Christ is going to rule, who is going to be a part of the kingdom. Even if we suffer, even if we suffer now, it is a part of, of our being now that we hope in Christ. We're not like those who are without hope. What does that look like? You know, like Paul, I think that we need to consider, we know what it looks like to be without hope. We see the despair all around us. So what would it look like to be one who lives in hope? Is it to always have a smile on your face? Sometimes smiles are artificial. I recently, I listened to the book Rocket Men, and, and I remember it saying that it, one of the things after, after uh, Buzz Aldrin and, uh, and Neil Armstrong came back from the moon, that they would be in these reception lines and that after hours and hours of smiling, their jaws, their, their faces would hurt because they had, had been smiling so much. Smiles can be artificial. Is it just to always be happy and to be smiling? No, it isn't. It's something else. It is to live knowing that this is not the end, but the, merely the beginning. It is to live in such a way that we don't live in this world simply for selfish gain. We don't live in order to create our own empire. That is part of the old nature. And the old nature has been replaced with the Spirit of God in Christ. If you really want to know what it looks like to live in the hope, to live in, in Christ, 
It's found in the example of Jesus himself, one who sacrificed himself for the good of all, one who did not see it as, as gain, but gave up his place next to God in order to come and to be in the, in the form of humanity and to suffer and to die for us. And it's not just us who are aware of this. Paul says that all of creation groans in anticipation of that new freedom that is to be found in Christ. So think about it. We think that our lives are a long time. And yet in reality, we live such a short period of time on this planet And living such a short period of time upon this planet and knowing we are called in Christ, what does that mean for us? Shouldn't it mean that we live in such a way that points to, points to everyone that we meet that we live in freedom? We live in a new direction no matter what it might cost us personally, that is immaterial when we realize and, and recognize what it is that God has done for us in Christ, what we are called to. You see, we are to live in anticipation of the inheritance. Let us pray. Father, as we read Romans and we, we, read, we read Paul's stories of sin and the law, we know that we are prone to, to this at times. And yet, and yet, Father, the majesty of what Paul calls us to in Christ, to live in as one who is a part of that inheritance. Father, we know that. We know it in our minds. We speak of it from our lips. We know it in our heart, for in our heart we have put our hope and our trust in Christ. And yet, because we live in this world, sometimes we lose sight of that. And so we pray this morning that as we are in this time and this place, touch us, renew us, minister to us, renewing in us the knowledge and the understanding of what it is to be new in you, as only you can. For yours is the gift of life. And we come to you now in the name of the one who gave himself for us, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.